Hey, what's going on? This is Felix, also known as Enoch, student at Absolute Bible Truth, and I'd like to give a big shout out to Sal Showtime and Debate Talk for you. I'm a frequent listener, been listening since season one. Uh, keep doing your thing, and for everybody out there who can hear this, send in your donations so Debate Talk for you could go on for a long time. All right, y'all. Peace. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Hebrewway.com. High quality custom Israelite apparel store. The place to find scripture based attire for men, women, and children of all ages. We have a wide range of t shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, caps, beanies, and bags available in a full range of sizes. Also, the ideal place to find Israelite gifts for family and friends. Hebrewway.com is geared toward awakening men and women and especially the youth worldwide. Try our uniquely crafted collection with free shipping on eligible items. Help spread the word of the Most High. Visit us at Hebrewway.com. That's Hebrewway.com. Gather yourself together with Fringes. Fringes is a new social networking app for the community. Are you looking to study, teach, cook, play, sew, and travel? Perhaps you're new to the area and are tired of spending Sabbaths alone? Are you looking for a place to post your events, products, and services? Rejoice! Fringes is here. Download free today. Available on Google Play and the App Store. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to another show. You're now listening to Debate Talk for you, Summer Special. I'm your host, Sal Showtime. We are back with another classic show for you guys. Well, once again, we are back live on Blog Talk Radio. We appreciate the family that's tuning in via phone and via Skype. Our dot in that number, 319-527-6239. Of course, we appreciate the listeners out there on social media that's checking out the show. If you're on Facebook and you're listening in the group, do me a favor, share it on your personal page. Let people know that Debate Talk for you is live on the air and make sure you call in 319-527-6239. Today's show is entitled Torah Teacher, Apostle Paul, and Circumcision. Again, today's show is entitled Torah Teacher, Apostle Paul, and Circumcision. My special guest is standing by. He's been on this show uh, plenty of times in the past, and now he is back to present this lesson to the Debate Talk for You audience. Without further ado, let me bring him in. This is Brother Judah. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Brother uh, Sal. And I appreciate the opportunity to come on the show. And uh, I'd like to greet the listening audience who have taken their time out to uh, tune in and listen to tonight's discussion. So I thank you for that. Almost definitely. What's been going on with you lately, man? What's the latest? Oh, you know, uh, taking it day by day, you know, and uh, trying to learn and, and understand the scriptures and know how to walk in this life that we're living in and, and make the right decisions and moves. You know what I mean? So Yeah, there we go. There we go. That's right. That's right. Take it one day at a time. <laughs> All right. So like I always say, get your pen and pads ready, take down some notes, and if you have any questions or any comments later on, um, once you dial that number, you got to press the number one and stand by. I'm going to go down in order and take some of your questions and your comments. You can also send me an email, debatetalkforyou at gmail.com. For those that are new to the show, you can call in via phone, call in via Skype, and an alternative is download on your smartphone Google Voice. Google Voice, that's an app. And that allows you to call into the show as well. So, all right, Brother Judah, take it away. Right. All right, all right. Thank you for that intro. And, uh, again, I'm Brother Judah, a representative of the NMP and a member of the Congregation of Israel. And tonight I want to deal with a topic about the Apostle Paul, the uh, Torah teacher. 
the Apostle Paul, and circumcision. And uh, I want to bring this out uh, because I've heard through the years uh, a lot of claims that people put on the Apostle Paul and say that he wasn't a Torah teacher. They claim that he'd done away with circumcision or told the people that they shouldn't be circumcised and thus and such and thus and such. Well, I argue that they haven't really carefully read the text to find out what the Apostle Paul or Saul was making reference to and the context of his arguments. But I would like to begin in the book of Acts, the 24th chapter today. And in the book of Acts, the 24th chapter, the Apostle Saul found himself in court. And and what's interesting about this is that rumors were spreading back then about the Apostle, and rumors are spreading now about the Apostle. And uh, I want to examine some of these things and put some of the stuff some things on the table for us to consider about this elder and teacher. And my advice to some people who move so quick to condemn or argue or try to spread these rumors about the Apostle Saul, they probably need to slow down. Uh, After all, he was a real man, as far as we're concerned, and he was a excellent teacher, and an elder. And I think people should slow down. A lot of times people get filled with some knowledge, and under, knowledge, I should say, and it does puff up. And they get to running off at the mouth when they really should take it slow. So Acts, the 24th chapter, I would like to begin. And here, like I said, the Apostle Saul was in court. And it was something interesting he had brought to the table because he was being accused by certain Israelites. Now, I want you all to bear with me a little bit today because in order for us to understand the the Apostle Saul's argument on circumcision, we have to know the platform in which he was running on. And when we can understand the platform in which he was running on or get an idea of the platform in which he was running on, then I think that we can come to understand a little bit more about his arguments concerning the circumcision. And I want you all to take heed and pay attention to some details here in his argument. Now, in chapter 24 and verse 10, this was Saul's defense before Felix. And I'll start reading here at verse 10. It reads, Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. And that's what we want to pay attention to. Paul was accused of a lot of things, but... He had the time to also speak on his behalf. So he's saying here, I would like to gladly answer for myself about all of these accusations against me. Now, in verse 11 it reads, Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So the apostle said he believed all things written in the law and the prophets, but however, what he was accused of, whether it was accusations made from the Gentiles 
for accusations made from the Israelites. These accusations, which they accused him of, or said that he was preaching heresy, he said, well, listen here. With the way in which you call heresy, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And what's interesting about this is that, yes, his teaching out of the law and the prophets, some people to this very day who call themselves Israelites call it heresy. But we're going to go into the law and to the prophets through the course of this discussion and show that it actually supports Paul or Saul's argument more specifically pertaining to circumcision. But Paul says something else, or Saul says something else in this chapter in verse 21. He said, Except it be for this one voice that I cry standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. And this is true, because when the Apostle Saul is speaking of the resurrection of the dead, this teaching of the resurrection of the dead has associated with it the doctrines and the principles of the New Covenant. The doctrines and the principles of the New Covenant is associated with the resurrection of the dead and also the new world, the new kingdom, the day in which all who oppress the world, all of the uh, ruling elite will be dispossessed and the earth will be given over to those who have been oppressed and afflicted. All this is a part of the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. It's just not a teaching about people coming out of the graves. It's a lot that goes along with it. Now, I brought out this because when he's arguing that I'm brought here because of the teachings of the resurrection of the dead, <clears throat> we're going to learn that what he's leaning towards is his teachings pertaining to the new covenant. How, because you have to meet the requirements of the new covenant in order to be found worthy to inherit the new world. Let's flip back to the 23rd chapter, chapter 23, <clears throat> book of Acts. Acts, the 23rd chapter, and he's going to say it again in verse 6. It says, but when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees, because these were all of his accusers and everybody came down to this council and to this meeting, Paul perceived that one part of it was Sadducees and the other Pharisees. He cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And people ask, may ask, Brother Judah, you're supposed to be talking about circumcision. What this stuff you talking about? Well, yes, it's all tied into it. We got the latest platform down. Yes, the hope. Notice what he said, the hope of the resurrection of the dead I am called in question. He's making reference to those who are to become a part of the new covenant, and when they become a part of the new covenant, then they will be found worthy to be a part of the resurrection of the dead to inherit the earth and be heirs, joint heirs, with the Messiah and all of the patriarchs to possess this planet. Now, he said, I'm caught in question because of this, resurrection of the dead. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Because I made some claims about the teachings of the resurrection of the dead. If you will, let's go back to the book of Isaiah, the 25th chapter. See, when he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, he's just not talking about people coming out of the graves. He's talking about why they're coming out of the graves. 
What is this about? And because of his stance and his teachings, profound, may, may I add, his teachings that he taught his students so they can be found worthy to be a part of the new covenant and to be a part of this resurrection of the dead, people call these teachings heresy. Now, we go to Isaiah 25th chapter just to establish something that I said. And we're going to look at the prophet Isaiah speak as well on the resurrection of the dead. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 6. If you have any questions or comments, please take your time out and call in, and I will address some questions. Uh, I'll begin reading at verse 6, Isaiah 25 and verse 6. It reads, Isaiah is proclaiming about the goodness of the Almighty and how the Almighty have turned the uh, rulers of the world, cities, into a heap. He have turned their palaces over, that it will never be built again. He have destroyed the strong people and the terrible nations. And he have redeemed and strengthened the poor so they can inherit the world. All this is actually a part of the teachings of the new covenant. And this is also an integral part of the resurrection of the dead. Why Paul said he's brought into question. So, I'm skipping down to verse 6, but to confirm what I just finished saying, start from verse 1 on your own time. But verse 6 reads this, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine and, of, and on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves, well refined, Verse 7 reads, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations. And that day people will begin to see clearly if they take hold on to his teaching. However, as he destroys the face of the covering cast over the people, as he removes the veil that has been spread over the nations, Notice the teaching in verse 8. He will swallow up death in victory. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all, all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And it, shall, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. You see, the salvation and the redemption of the people are associated with death being swallowed up in victory, which Paul associated with the resurrection of the dead. So it's important to understand how to be a part of this people that shall proclaim, we have waited for him. We will, be, we will rejoice and be glad and in his salvation. Now, in order for you to be a part of this remnant, you must be a part of the new covenant. You got to be. And I know you may be wondering about the circumcision, but we got to lay the context of Paul's arguments first, so when we look at the circumcision argument, you will begin to see what the Apostle Saul was teaching. And then you will begin to understand that all of his accusers from back then until this day, really, at the end of the day, they all need to give the Apostle Saul an apology. Now, let's look at this. Let's go on to Acts, back to Acts, the 21st chapter. 
Acts the 21st chapter. Because, you know, I mean, and people talk big today. They talk real big about the apostles. And, you know, some people nowadays, they call themselves scholars, and some people call themselves paying what Paul had wrong. And and, and and these people claim, nowadays, they claim to be these Hebrew scholars, and many of them are just simply Hebrew, Hebrew illiterate. And uh, they can't touch Paul when it comes down to being an Israelite, but those are the teachings. Ask the 21st chapter. What they need to do is sit down and try to learn what this teacher was teaching. Now, a rumor started. Now, he said, I'm brought before the people because of this teaching of the resurrection of the dead. That's why I'm here. That's what he was explaining. And uh, there was a rumor that began to take place. Acts chapter 21, verse 17. And notice this rumor. Acts chapter 21. Now I'll begin reading that verse 17. It says, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. These are the other apostles and James and all of them coming together and Paul all coming down to Jerusalem. And they got wind that Paul also had set foot on the soil. Verse 18, And the day following Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, this is what they tell him, Paul. Look, look, Paul, look at this. You see how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous after the law. However, though, notice verse 21. And they are informed of these, that thou teachest all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Sound familiar today, don't it? But Paul understood, I'm brought here because of his teaching of the resurrection of the dead, this teaching of the resurrection of the dead, I have to deal with the foundations, Paul will argue, and that the foundations is being ready and prepared in your heart and mind to be a part of the new covenant, or else you have nothing coming. However, in the midst of these teachings and the method in which Paul was delivering his teachings, the people got the impression that he was teaching the Jews that were among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and saying they shouldn't circumcise their children nor walk after the customs, all right? So verse 22 reads, what is it therefore? James and the brothers wanted to know, what's this matter? Is this true? The multitude must needs come together, but they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say unto thee. We have four men which have a, a vial on them, them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may say that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Well let's see if Paul will Hearken. Let's see if the Apostle Paul will agree. Now, the next verse reads, As touching the Gentiles, which believe. Now, you notice the difference. They already made a decree among the Gentiles, which we're going to address too, that a lot of people have misunderstood concerning the circumcision. 
But first they had to clear up Paul wasn't telling the Israelites not to be circumcised. So he had to confirm this. No, I'm not teaching nothing like that. Nor am I teaching them not to walk after the custom. But verse 25 again. As touching the Gentiles which believe we have written and concluded. That they observe no such thing. Save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols. And from blood. And from strangled. And from fornication. So they had made a decree about the circumcision and the Gentiles. And people, I will, they were saying that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised and this and that. Well, let's find out the whole story on what they were saying about the Gentiles not being circumcised. What was their argument? And people could read right over it. But today, I want to bring it to our attention if it hasn't been brought to your attention already. So verse 26 says, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So he did as the elders had asked. Why did Paul go into the temple? He went into the temple to confirm that the charges whereof they were confirmed that they were informed concerning thee, in verse 24, are nothing. So Paul followed up, showing no, by action, he showed, no, these charges, no, that's not what I'm teaching at all. But they did mention something about the Gentiles. And the decision that they came up with pertaining to the Gentiles. And this is where many of the modern-day people who call themselves Christians as well argue. And I say on on their behalf as well, even though that they may admire the Apostle Paul or Saul, nevertheless, they still distort and um, lie on him as a teacher. Now, if we go back to the book of uh, Acts chapter 15, we flip back to Acts chapter 15. Let's learn about this decree, and let's see what was going on. Remember what he said in Acts. Thousands of brothers which believe. Thousands which believe, and they are all zealous after the law. Well, let's look and see what was going on. Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 1. Notice this. Notice this very carefully. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, Ye cannot be saved. That is what people read right past and don't understand the significance of what was being said here. This started the whole argument. It's not whether you ought to be circumcised or not per se. The argument is whether you being circumcised will save you. Whether you being circumcised will clear you of guilt. And this is where as people follow Paul and they took a whole they they they, they went down a whole nother road. Instead of paying attention what this teacher was bringing to the table. Now look again, what is the argument? Brothers came down and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now remember, this ties back into the resurrection of the dead because the resurrection of the dead teaching is associated with salvation. And if we will be found worthy to take part in the first resurrection, then we must be saved. Now, 
there was an argument here. Wait a minute. You saying that you got to be, you saying that circumcision will save you? Brothers and sisters, keeping a Sabbath day won't save you. Keeping the feast days won't save you. Wearing fringes don't save you. People say, brother, what in the world are you talking about? Pay attention to the teaching of Paul. What the manner in which you claim that he was teaching was heresy? So it is written in the law of the prophets. We're going to find this out. Paul will make a thorough argument to support this case. Is he saying you don't have to be circumcised? No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. You don't have to be circumcised to be cleared of guilt. And some people stop right there. And they get to acting a fool, and they get to arguing mad at everybody else, mad at Paul, because they stop right there in the midst of his argument, not listening to the entire argument, and therefore they're running around accusing a Torah teacher who was chosen by the Almighty. You might be messing yourself up there. People, you better slow down and approach this Bible with respect and approach these teachers with respect. I hear a lot of people through the years, I'm talking about through the years, I heard them say some big words against these elders. Whether it was Sim, Simon, Peter, or Kepha, whether it was James or Jacob, they have spoken some big words against them, and especially Jesus of Nazareth. And the more I hear the arguments, I know that these people don't understand. One reason why is because their arguments that, is, that, that they use against Paul and the others are arguments that were simply created by Western theology. These people who argue against Paul and say Paul said this, Paul said that, their arguments are founded upon the interpretations of Western theology. And that's why I say Western theology cut with a two-edged sword, knocking people down because they haven't bothered to humble themselves and search the scriptures, not jump in the Bible like you know it all and a scholar. But as my elder told me many years ago, go in the Bible and let the Bible talk to you. And that might be one of the most difficult tasks, is just let it speak to you. Now, it says that they argued that except a man be circumcised, he cannot be saved. So verse 2 in Acts chapter 15 says this, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. What question? Circumcision going to save you. Unless you be circumcised, you can't be saved. Yes, because if you teach us something like that, you can set the wrong you can get the wrong thing going here. Now let's get down to verse six. Notice this. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. All these Torah teachers coming together. You may figure, well, why in the world they got to dis what's the argument about? Moses said be circumcised. Ezekiel said be circumcised. Well, you might think that uh, it was just clear, cut, and dry. But that's why people stumble today. It's not about being circumcised. It's about whether the circumcision clears you of guilt and saves you. So these Torah teachers had to come together to discuss this matter to put it in, in order. There is an order here that has to be established. So we continue in verse 7 of Acts chapter 15. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, notice carefully what Peter said, 
men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Notice what their argument is. It's about salvation. So Peter immediately rises up with the disputing, and he brings one of the primary principles to the table, faith and belief. Know that the Creator sent me to the Gentiles, and when I went to them, that they should hear the words of the gospel, and that they should believe. Notice verse 8. Peter continues, And God, which knoweth the heart, another principle to understand these Torah teachers, belief, and now this other principle, the heart. And God, which knoweth the heart, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost or the Holy Ruach or the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. Why did Peter bring this to the table? Because the Spirit came upon those who was uncircumcised. Why? Because they believed. Notice what Peter, notice what Peter's going to say. And God, verse 8 again, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts, clearing them of guilt. You understand where we're going now? Purifying their hearts, cleaning them up by what? Faith, not by the works of the law. This is something that Israelites today don't get. People claim to be Torah teachers, and I hear it, it's a mess. And I notice that a lot of guys and gals, they romanticize the Bible. They, they get caught up in the Bible like it's a storybook and, real, and forget that this is real life stuff we're dealing with. And they read it like a story, like a, 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 a novel. And they want to live like those people. They want to dress like them. And, and, and all of the outward actions they want to follow. Don't get me wrong. Wearing fringes and, and, and your beards and, and, and all of that stuff, whatever the Torah teach, I believe. I believe it was given to the fathers. But I also believe it's not good to romanticize or else you may miss the point. And me saying this, when you start to read the Torah and the prophets, the people forget all about the important part that the Torah and the prophets stressed. That is a clean heart. And only by means of a clean heart will you be able to partake in the resur first resurrection Only with a clean heart will you be heirs to take over the world because you got to usher in justice, peace, equity. Time and millennia have shown all those who haven't had a clean heart are not rightful rulers of the earth. you got to have a clean heart. This is pertaining to the resurrection of the dead. This is the new covenant. The new covenant is, I will make an agreement with you, says Yah, that if you clean up your heart by way of belief and submitting yourself and believe in me, I will blot out your iniquities and forget your transgressions, and I will bring you back to the inheritance that I've promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And you shall inherit the earth forever. Who? Those of a clean heart. Those of a pure heart. This is the foundation of the new covenant. Don't you know 
that it was nothing but circumcised Israelites who got kicked out of the land and were plundered by the Babylonians? Don't you know it was none other but circumcised Israelites who plundered and robbed and exploited their own people in Jerusalem? Don't you know it was circumcised Israelites who profited and plundered their own people while they collected the revenues from the temple, while they observed the feast days, while they observed the Sabbath and couldn't wait for it to be over so they can send the citizens out to work and extract agriculture and commodities to bring it to the world market of Tyrus, of Babylon, so they can increase their riches just like the heathen. All these ruling class Israelites were all circumcised and they all bragged about the ceremonial aspects of the law Isaiah spoke about it in Isaiah, the first chapter. Amos spoke about it as well, where he spoke about it, and they exiled Amos because he criticized their religious rituals or their ceremonial rituals. All in the meanwhile, they plundered their own inhabitants. All these were circumcised Israelites. Once we can understand what was going on with the Israelites in the days of old, then we can understand these Torah teachers, Saul, James, Simon, Barnabas, and the host of these great elders who risked their lives to continue the movement for the kingdom of God once we truly understand, then I believe we can give the respect due to these elders. If you don't give the respect due to these elders, then you're going to suffer the consequences. And I want to show you today that people are heaping up trouble by making false accusations against the Apostle Saul and the rest of the elders. Because they done got tangled up in deceit and they haven't seen the true teaching. You see what Peter's saying in Acts 15? You see what he's explaining? That the Creator put no difference purifying their hearts by faith? You see what Peter was explaining when he went to the Gentiles and the Ruach of the Spirit came upon them? By way of what? By way of belief. But by no means is that where they are to stop. They never said that. None of them. Notice the argument as we continue in Acts chapter 15. And this is the problem. People stop here, but these apostles didn't stop here. They're telling you the foundations. No, man, in order to be saved, you got to believe. Works of the law can't save you. Works of the law didn't save the old Israelites. Don't you know that they was keeping the feast days when a high priest and the Sanhedrin, the government of Israel, they didn't even want to go into the court of the Gentiles because they didn't want to be made unclean so that they can keep the Passover. All in the meanwhile, they was plundering the Judeans. They robbed them. They exploited them. They got kicked back from the Romans. And they lied on the peasant prophet who came to revisit the covenantal practices of Moses, whom we call Jesus of Nazareth. They lied on him, delivered him over to the authority so he could be executed. All in the meanwhile, they were keeping the Passover, so-called, and they called themselves keeping the Sabbath day, and I'm willing to wager every single one of them, a part of the Sanhedrin, was all circumcised. So if we go back to Acts chapter 15, Peter continues in verse 10, after he said, The Creator put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts with faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? 
Why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What yoke? The yoke of trying to be justified by the works of the law. Seeing that under the first covenant you were condemned and bound to the death sentence. And if you believe that in order for you to be saved and justified, you will do some works of the law, you are putting a yoke upon the disciples, which none of the Israelites were able to bear. That's why they were waiting for the redemption of the Israelites by way of the Messiah. And by way of the Messiah, redemption came by way of belief. Now, we being justified by belief in a pure heart, why in the world are you going to put a yoke on the Gentiles and make them believe that they're going to be justified by the works and saved by works of the law? Because that's not the case. That never was the case. Verse 11, Peter concludes or adds, But we believe that through the grace, which is a free gift, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. How are the Israelites saved? Not by circumcision, according to Peter, but by belief in the Lord Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach and belief in him is the way in which the Israelites shall be saved, even as the Gentiles. That's how they're going to be saved, not by the works of the law. Verse 13. And now that they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. I want to skip down. Verse 19. Wherefore my sentence is, Trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned unto God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols. Notice now, pollution of idols, they're still making reference to the Torah. They're giving them boundaries. I stand from idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Notice verse 21, part of the keys here. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So what significance is that? is that as the Gentiles continue to learn and read, as the Gentiles continue to learn and get taught, they will be persuaded out of their own hearts as they learn the law and the prophets, which Paul said he believed. As the Torah teachers teach the law and the prophets, then the Gentiles will gradually learn, and then they will follow suit, on what is necessary to be obedient unto the Creator. Let's go into the book of Romans so we can follow this up. The book of Romans. The book of Romans, so Paul or Saul can add a little bit more to this. So you see, brothers and sisters, the argument isn't circumcision per se. The argument is circumcision saving you, or you being circumcised saving you. That is a falsity. Anyone who teach anything like that is false. That is a false teaching today. It was a false teaching during the days of the apostles, and it was a false teaching during the days and when the Torah was given and taught among the elders and the prophets. Moses never declared that circumcision saves you. But what did he declare? 
He declared in the book of Deuteronomy that only there, if there was a heart in them. This is what the Almighty requires. A clean heart with them, that it will be well with them always. So what Peter and Paul is bringing to the table is 100% correct. Circumcision don't save you. And to teach the Gentiles that they got to be circumcised to be saved is false. Now, Paul's going to follow up with this argument, and he's going to hit them out of the Torah now. Remember, he said the what they call hearsay. So I, so I believe all things that's written. So whatever I'm teaching and whatever they call a hearsay, I'm teaching what's in the law of the prophets. Some people say, well, he couldn't be. Oh, yeah, he is. Let's go into Romans, if you will, the fourth chapter, so we can follow up with this argument. It's not hard. But people, if you've been taught by Western theology, it's like people run around the date. They argue today, even on the other end. People who call themselves Christians, they running around talking about you ain't got to do this. You ain't got to be circumcised. You can eat pig. You can do anything you want to do. It's just all through faith. See, those, that's, that's the other extreme. Those are the, that, those are the other extremes. What we need to do is slow down and read what the book is saying. It got a lot to say. Now, Romans chapter 4. The Romans, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 1, it reads, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? This is important. So Paul, going back to Abraham, we're going back to the Torah. He said he believed what was written in the Law and the Prophets, which y'all claiming Paul was a heretic about. He's getting it out of the Law and the Prophets. The Torah teachers came to their conclusion from what they learned out of the Law and the Prophets. So what did Abraham, our father, find pertaining to the flesh? Verse 2, for if Abraham were justified by works, notice carefully, all about to hit him hard. And I want everybody who listening and anyone who go against Paul, I want you to hear this one. Saul says, what did Abraham find? For if Abraham were justified by works, in other words, if Abraham was cleared of guilt by works, which is being associated, being saved. He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. Remember them, them words Peter used? Believe, believe. Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. His belief caused God to show him favor. His belief caused God to clear him of guilt. His belief caused God to save him and to make a covenant with him. His belief didn't have nothing to do with works. Now notice, Paul going to follow up. He was say, well, yeah, Abraham kept the law, statutes, commandments of God. Yes, he did, but you better put your timeline in order. Put it in order. Notice what Paul going to say. Paul going to demand he will demand that you put this in order. So I know everybody want to pull up Genesis 25 or Genesis 26, but we're going back to Genesis chapter 12. Abraham believed, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, correct? Now notice what Paul says. Now to him that, in verse 4, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. In other words, if Abraham was justified by his works, that means God owed him something. That means God had a debt to pay to Abraham. He owed Abraham something because Abraham did something. Now God said, here, I owe you this. Abraham didn't do nothing. It was a free gift. We all sinned. 
See, when you go to work and you work for your boss, you get a check at the end of the week because he owe you that check. But when you don't work and you get a check at the end of the week, then that's a gift. So Paul is explaining that Abraham, what he received was grace. It wasn't a debt God owed him because how good Abraham was. Verse Four again. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckon of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. This is what he was arguing about the Gentiles, the ungodly. They got to believe first. Then they will be cleared of guilt. You don't believe that's what... That's, that, that's how it goes. Notice what Paul's saying. That was verse 5 I just read for you. I want to skip down to verse 8. Verse 8 reads, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? Or upon the uncircumcision also? So, this blessedness, this grace that God has given to sinners, is it just for Israel? Some will argue, yeah, but we got other teachers on that. Peter already showed you and Acts, yeah, the Spirit came on them, purifying their hearts just like it came on us, which was the circumcision, purifying our hearts through belief in Yeshua HaMashiach. So Paul is arguing, is this reward only upon the uh, 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 Israelites or the circumcised or upon the uncircumcision also? Or is this upon those who are uncircumcised as well? Is this upon the Gentiles as well? Just in case there's any confusion, notice what Paul says. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Paul bringing us back here. Now notice, yeah, we now I just proved to you Abraham believed. This is what Paul is saying. I proved Abraham believed and was counted unto him for righteousness. Right? Okay. If that's the case, then notice what Paul going to bring it to. <clears throat> Verse nine. Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? How was this righteousness reckoned to Abraham? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? That's a good question. And this is a question that people, our friends, read right past. Paul is establishing his argument from the Torah. Was Abraham cleared of guilt, saved of God? Did God make a covenant with Abraham to save him to, for he can inherit the new world? Did all of these blessings and promises come upon Abraham while he was circumcised or while he was uncircumcised? As soon as the gainsayers answered this question, Paul cut them right down at the knees. He shuts it all down. What Paul say, verse 10, was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Paul argued, you see my point, Abraham was justified by God before he was even circumcised. Why did God justify him? Because he believed. So why in the world would you teach that in order for you to be justified and saved, in order for God to make a covenant with you to inherit the new world, 
like the covenant he made with Abraham, why are you going to go around teaching people that they got to be circumcised in order for this to happen? Why you got to, why are you going around teaching that? When actually, in order for them to be justified and saved, they just got to believe first. Now, to our other friends on the other end of the, of, of the pole, do we stop there? Is Paul saying throw circumcision out the window? He can't be because he's saying he believes all things written in the law and the prophets. And he's going to prove it here. He already proved it in Acts. Everything that they were saying about him, he's showing it was nothing. Now, notice what he's saying. Look, verse 10, he declared, no, Abraham received the promise while he was uncircumcised. Nevertheless, Verse 11, I'll start from verse 10 again and read right through. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, not while he was circumcised he received these promises, but in uncircumcision, while he was uncircumcised, he received the gift of God. And, verse 11, and he received, notice this, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. You see how Paul gave you the whole story? Look, this is the this is the protocol. This is the order. Salvation do not come by you being circumcised, sir. Salvation comes by belief. Once you believe and your heart is purified through faith, the elders declare Moses is being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Why is that? So now once the Gentiles believe, then they can follow the steps of Abraham and learn the Torah and the prophets and then they will walk in those steps of Abraham. Meaning this, Abraham believed it was counted unto him for righteousness as a sign of his belief. Abraham was obedient to the law. Abraham was obedient to the commandment. And this is the same thing with the Gentiles. No, to be saved, you don't have to be circumcised. To be saved, you just got to believe. Once you believe, though, then you will follow the steps of Abraham, and you're going to show the signs of your belief by being obedient to the law and the prophets as a sign of your belief. James declared the same thing. Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. That same James who said that is the same James who stood up in the council given the order of the Gentiles. So when Paul was teaching about circumcision, he wasn't teaching that the Gentiles got to run out and get circumcised to be saved because he knew that wasn't going to save them. Paul had to focus on first what will save them, and that is belief. And Paul knew that their belief had to lead into a purified heart, and once they believe and have a purified heart, then Paul declared, walk ye in the spirit, which is walking after spirit, after the spirit and principles of the Torah as a sign of the faith in which you had while you were yet uncircumcised. 
And is this the teaching of the prophets? Abraham showed that he had a purified heart, and God pure or had a, he had a heart to believe, and the Almighty purified his heart, and then Abraham kept the command. Let's go back again to the Torah, to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10. I know people say, Paul, run around, say you shouldn't be circumcised. Boy, you didn't read that well, did you? You need to stop listening to what everybody else is saying and go listen to what Paul said. Now, he said he spoke for himself. He got all these letters in here, and you're only going to pull out one passage or two or three verses and then, then run around and talk about what Paul said. Why don't you read his argument? The reason why you don't read his argument is because you still shell shock from all of the falsities that came out of Western Christianity. Well, what you need to do is repent and believe the gospel and go back and read the scriptures and stop adding your own interpretation to it. Go in and let the Bible talk to you and listen to these men's arguments. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12, so we could find out that the apostles was, was following along the lines of the Torah. He done already proved that circumcision do not justify you because Abraham, according to the Torah, was justified before he was circumcised. Then Abraham followed the way and the command. So, brothers and sisters, Deuteronomy chapter 10. And starting at verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12, it reads, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? Where does fear start? In our heart. To walk in his ways. You see, fear, got to start with the heart first, to believe. You got to believe the fear. And then you walk in his ways. Notice again, to love him, where does the love start? In the heart. And serve the Lord, or Yah. You see that? What comes first? The fear, which is integral with belief, and the love. For the creator, which is integral with the belief, and then the action. So what does the Lord require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to love him, and to serve him, or and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Soul to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord hath the light in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Notice this. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, that ye be no more stiff-necked. You see what Paul and the apostles are teaching? Before you can even serve him, before you can even submit to his word, where you will not be stiff-necked and rebel against his word, you must circumcise the heart first. The heart must be purified first. This is the Torah teacher, Paul's teaching, 
pertaining to the circumcision. This was the platform. Flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 30. The heart must be circumcised first. That's why Paul argued, listen, a circumcised heart is the only thing that will save you. Not the letter of the law. Why you think David didn't die? According to the letter of the law, David was supposed to have died for his sins. According to the letter of the law, we all was to die for our sins. What has saved us? What have allowed us to live? It's mercy. What will allow us to live even in a new world? To inherit the world forevermore? A circumcised heart and belief in him. Paul wasn't teaching it contrary to the Torah. He was doing none other but teaching the Torah in its rightful manner and order. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30, read verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. Shall return. What would re- that mean? And you will repent. And shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice. What, 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 what has to happen first? Your heart got to be changed to repent, to return. Then we will obey his voice. According to all that I command thee this day, Thou and thy children, with what? With all thine heart and with all thy soul. That then, see, when your heart is circumcised, when you believe through faith, when our heart is totally submissive and believe in the Creator and the one whom he sent, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. When will that happen? When you repent. Then you're going to be saved when you believe Yahweh Elohim. And then be obedient. That's what Paul and I was teaching. The Gentiles got to believe first. Then they shall be cleared of guilt. Then they be obedient. Like Abraham was obedient. He believed first. Then he got circumcised. The Gentiles believe first. Then they will go into the synagogues and learn the ways of God. For Moses is being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Same argument. Same argument. The elders of the new covenant have not deviated one bit from the spirit and the teachings of the law and the prophets. Verse 6 in Deuteronomy 30, after he declared that he will gather them, verse 6 reads, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Who will circumcise thine heart? Notice. Very carefully. The Almighty will circumcise our hearts. Just like Peter said in Acts, the Creator purified their hearts. It was God who purified their hearts by faith. You remember that? In the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, for edification. Peter said in verse 9 that the Creator put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Who did the purifying? The Creator. Peter is doing none other than establishing what we've been reading in Deuteronomy. It's the Creator who shall change the heart. He shall do it. But in order for it to happen, we got to believe in order for the working of his spirit to transform the heart. See, he does it. 
And that's what he's saying with Moses. See, when he's saying, purify your hearts, he's saying, submit to me. Believe me. And fear before me. Then he can mold and shape the heart. Then he could write the laws upon the heart and the conscience. Making us eligible. For the new covenant. At the resurrection of the dead, we will also be found worthy to inherit the world. You see what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 30? That it is Yahweh Elohim who will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. You see how the heart had to change first by way of belief? To love. The Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live, that you may inherit eternal life. Your heart got to be circumcised. And Paul or Saul and the apostles, this was their ministry, that they had to teach the circumcision of the heart as the foundations, and they could not teach that your justification or your salvation will happen by works of the law. No, by belief. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, because the Creator said that He, it is Him who will circumcise the heart. That's the Torah. Now let's go to the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah the 31st chapter. When we get to Jeremiah the 31st chapter, notice carefully in verse 31. Jeremiah 31. And verse 31. It reads, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. See, they broke the first covenant. That's why Paul said in the book of Hebrews, the first covenant was ready to vanish away. And this is the confusion many of our people and our uh, 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 brothers have. Or should I say many of the inhabitants who attempt to study the Bible. This is where they stumble. When Paul say we're not under the law, they think he's doing away with the Torah. No. Being under the law, he's talking about the first covenant. As he said in the book of Hebrews, which was ready to vanish away. But he is a minister of the new covenant. And this is what the Creator is explaining. I will make a new covenant with them. Verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant. That I will make with the house of Israel After those days Saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts I will write it in their hearts You see how he said in Deuteronomy That he will give us a circumcised heart You see what he's saying in Jeremiah and the prophets That it is the creator Who will Write 
the law upon our hearts. It is the working and the administration of the Spirit of God only through belief in Him, which will bring forth this transformation of the heart. I will write it upon their hearts. He said, I will, verse 33 again, excuse me, uh, verse 33, yes. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their, in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them, saith the Lord, or excuse me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin no more. And we have other teachings in depth on this new covenant. Because people wonder, well, we, every man teach the Lord. We don't need no teachers. No, no, that's actually not what he was talking about in depth. We can go into what he was talking about. The key is to know Yahweh. And we have teachings on what it means to know Yahweh and we're, or, or Yehoah. We're not talking about a memory knowledge. But we have other teachings on it. To show you what they were saying. The apostles hit towards it. When they talk about the anointing. That they have no need that any man teach them. Why? Because the perfect love. Have come upon them. Where they love their neighbor. As their self. But we have other teachers on that. But the administration of this work. Of the new covenant. Can only take place by belief. And you must believe in order to be saved because you've got to believe in order for the law to be written upon your heart. If the law not written upon the heart, then you're not going to be saved. I don't care how much circumcision you have. Now let's go on to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, we're working our way out. If you have any questions, please, questions or comments, write them down and we'll be open up the line so we can uh, answer some of these questions. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. And this is what the Apostle Paul tried to get through the head of the people in his day. And this is what got to get through the heads of the people today who claim that they are students of the scriptures. Second Corinthians chapter 3, Paul will explain his platform. Paul will begin, or Saul will begin to explain the angle in which we ought to view his teachings. And this can be found in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, and I'm going to jump right down to verse 4. 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. It reads, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything, as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. We're nothing. All that we have comes from the Creator. Any knowledge, anything, understanding, wisdom comes from the Creator. Notice this, though. Who also, the Creator, Yehoah, who also hath made us Able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, 
but of the Spirit. But the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Now, people read this, and some of our friends believe that when he's saying that we are able ministers of the New Testament, some of us believe that he's talking about the books from Matthew to Revelation. He couldn't be, because Revelation wasn't written yet. Philippians and all of these books wasn't organized yet. When the Apostle Saul is talking about ministers of the New Testament, look it up. He's talking about ministers of the New, ministers of the new Covenant. That same covenant we read about in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is teaching us that the Creator is making a covenant with the law upon our hearts because this is what he desired from the Torah from the beginning, a circumcised heart. So Saul is explaining, we are ministers of this administration of the new covenant so the law of God could be written upon your heart, and it only could be written upon your hearts through belief in Hamashiach and belief in the Creator, then you could be saved. Not any other way, but through belief. Now look, verse 7. But if the ministration of death was death written and engraven in stones was glorious, he's talking about the first covenant. Where was the law written in the first covenant? On stone. As long as you did it by the letter, you wasn't stoned to death. The administration of death. Why is, why is Paul calling the first covenant? Not the Old Testament making reference to the law and the prophets, like some people erroneously teach. No, it's the covenant. The first covenant was the administration of death. Why? Because if you read the Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 27 teaches us that all of the elders established the covenant on the mount, on the mountains, two mountains. And they declared curses as every man who continueth not in all things written in the law. Well, guess what? We didn't continue in it. And guess what? We cursed under the first covenant. That's why he said in Jeremiah that we broke the first covenant. Therefore, we are all condemned to death. That's why the Apostle Paul is calling the first covenant which is also called the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, the administration of death. Not the books, not Moses' books and the books of the prophets. It's the covenant. So Saul is explaining. This administration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Speaking of the first covenant, it is to be done away with. All Moses' face being illuminated, him wearing a veil, all of the events that Paul is speaking of at this moment was all under the first covenant. The written law on stone, the sprinkling of the blood, that was all associated with the first covenant. And when Paul talked about the law being done away with, he is making reference to the law in the context of the first covenant. The letter, not the law itself, because it's the same law that is being administered in the new covenant, but not on tables of stone, but in the heart. Notice this. Verse 8. How shall, 
how shall not the administration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the administration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the administration of righteousness exceed in glory. That righteousness of the purifying of the heart, that covenant, what it shall produce, shall be more glorious than what the first covenant produced. What did the first covenant produce? It produced a bunch of Israelites whose heart wasn't conformed to the ways of the Torah, and they exploited and robbed and plundered their own people. They wasn't an example to the nations. And th- in fact, they joined unto the nations, serving the wealth and the riches of Baalim and feudalism, and even unto this day, capitalism. But the new covenant, which is glorious, shall bring in a world of justice and peace and equity, a classless society, a society where no man going to be plundered, a society where no man going to be robbed, a society where no man going to be hungry or homeless. That's what he was explaining. The first covenant law pointed towards a society like that, not a religion, but a society as such. But they didn't see it. And this is what he was explaining. That which was done away with will is nowhere com- to be compared with what this new covenant will produce. Because people believe that the Torah was producing a religion. It is not. It never was. The Torah was trying to create a nation of people to bring justice to the world. Genesis chapter 18, verse 18 and 19 tells you that's why Israel was called. This is what the blessings of the nations is about. This is why the Gentiles are going to go to Israel, to learn how to establish a world of justice and equity, not robbery and plunder and competition and every other thing you see in these corrupt empires. The new covenant does away with all of that. The new covenant ushers in the world where there shall be peace. A circumcised heart will bring this in. This is what the Apostle Paul was dealing with in circumcision. That's why he was telling them being circumcised in the flesh will not save you. It will not bring nothing in that God is promising. If you believe, that will bring it in. And if you believe, yes, you will keep the law. If you believe, yes, you will be circumcised. Notice. But we had to establish the groundwork first. And when we, verse 10 Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, meaning the children of Israel did not see the goal where the first covenant was pointing towards. Why not? Why didn't they understand what the first covenant was pointing towards? Verse 14, because their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away. In the reading of the Old Testament, or in the reading of the First Covenant. So when we're reading the Law and the Prophets, which contained the First Covenant, you still don't see what Moses was talking about in the First Covenant while we're reading it. But their minds were blinded until this day, Remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant or the First Covenant? Which veil? 
is done away in Christ, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. You don't see it. But when you believe in the Messiah and your heart is circumcised, when you read the first covenant, then you will know what the first covenant was pointing towards. Then you will understand the Torah, not by the letter, like I got to go get circumcised, but you're going to understand it by the spirit. I got to have a correct heart. Then my circumcision will be worth something. That's when you read the Torah and the first covenant by the spirit of the second covenant. Or the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And we almost finished here. In essence, what is this teaching us? We have to reach a higher consciousness. Our conscience must be changed, thereby reaching a higher consciousness. And notice Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Let's skip down. Subject the first covenant, which was done away. The covenant. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats, and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to purification of the flesh, how much more shall the blood or the life, because that's what blood represents, walking in the life of Christ, being washed by his blood, meaning walking in his life, his life cleaning you up, how much more shall the blood of the Christ or the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot, to God in order to do what? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see, it's the same story. A purged conscience is the same thing as a purified heart. A purged conscience and a purified heart is the same thing as a circumcised heart. The circumcised heart is first the purge conscience is first, then this will lead unto our salvation. But you cannot get a purge conscience unless you believe. Notice what he continues to argue in Romans, or excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 9. So he offered himself to purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant or the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, all Israel sinned under the first covenant, They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. What eternal inheritance? That eternal inheritance that Abraham received while he was yet uncircumcised. That eternal inheritance inheritance that Abraham received when he believed. Flip right over, if you will, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Yehoah, or the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, Where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. The first covenant is fading away. Okay, this is what he explains here in Romans as well. 
It was ready to vanish. The first covenant was ready to vanish. Verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in, into their hearts and into their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Verse 22 reads, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And that's why the Apostle Paul took his stance with circumcision like he did. He had to teach them circumcision don't save you. A clear and a clean heart and a purged conscience is what saves you, but it only comes through belief. But, as he said in Romans, if we follow the steps of Abraham, after we believe, and the Most High give us a clean slate, then we follow the steps of Abraham. So Abraham was justified by faith. Then what did Abraham do? He went and got circumcised. Then he kept the laws of God. James and then was arguing the same thing. In the book of Acts 15, don't tell the Gentiles that they got to be circumcised to be saved. That's the argument. Circumcision don't save you. So they're not saying don't be circumcised. They're telling you circumcision don't save you. Only thing that saves you is belief, and the God clears us of guilt, purifies our heart through faith, and then we keep the laws of God. Signified in Acts chapter 15, when the elders said, Moses is being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So they're going to go learn what to do. Now let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Because this is where people go to get to reading. And, 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 and we had the latest foundation first so they can understand that what the Apostle Paul was arguing didn't have nothing to do. He wasn't telling people don't be circumcised. That wasn't his ministry per se. His ministry was about getting your heart right because he was the minister of the new covenant. And they put great emphasis on the transformation of the spirit and mind by way of belief. Not the letter of the law. The letter of the law, that's going to come. That's just going to happen when you believe God. You're just going to want the creator to change your heart. You, you're going to do the commandments. It, it won't even be a struggle. It won't be an argument. It will not be a debate. So here in Galatians, Galatians, chapter 5, and this is what people run to. They don't, that, see, I had to take that whole route to establish Paul's argument. So now when you go to Galatians, you will know what he's talking about. Galatians 5 and 1. Notice what the Torah teacher teaches. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. What liberty? He freed us from the condemnation of death that was pending under the first covenant. So stand fast in being free from the bondage of sin. Sin held us in bondage and sentenced us to death under the first covenant. Not the laws, but the first covenant. Stand fast, therefore, in that liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In other words, if you don't seek Christ and the new covenant, then you're going to automatically, by default, fall into the first covenant and its condemnation. Because you have no 
Redeemer. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall not profit you nothing. And people read that. See, Paul saying, you, you know, don't be circumcised. And like as a confrontation with Christ and circumcision. No, it's no confrontation in, with Christ and circumcision. You got to finish reading to understand a man's argument. He already established it in verse 1. The liberty in which he's talking about is being free from the old covenant and its condemnation. And then he says, if you be circumcised, Christ won't profit you anything. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Let's continue. For Verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Well, why is he testifying this? Because if you're not following the Messiah to go under the new covenant, then you're remaining under the old covenant. And under the old covenant, it was Israelites who said, I'm going to read it for you. Deuteronomy chapter 27, the book of the law. Understand what he's talking about here. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Hear the elders pronounce the curse. Deuteronomy 27 and 1, it says, And Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Come ye all the, keep ye all the commandments which I command you this day. And so all the fathers came down, and they stood yet on these mountains. Okay? And they could, came down, and uh, verse 11, And Moses charged the people, saying, Moses charged the people the same day, saying, these shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when ye are come over Jordan, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ezekiel, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Cursed be the man that maketh the graven and molten image. I'm going to skip down. Verse 18. Cursed be the man that uh, caused the blind to wander out of the way. Verse 19. Cursed be the man that perverteth the judgment. Curse. Verse 21. Cursed be the man that lieth with any manner of beast. Verse 23. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall stay a man. Verse 26, notice. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law. Not some of the words, but that confirmeth. Cursed be the one that don't confirm and do all the words of this law to do them and all the people shall say, so be it. Amen. And that's what they did. So now, under the first covenant, if we broke one of those laws, we're cursed. So Paul is arguing back in Galatians. I testify unto you, if you're going to be circumcised after the manner of the first covenant, you got to keep the whole law. And Christ won't profit you anything because you're seeking to be justified by works and not through faith in Mashiach. Notice he's going to explain it again. Galatians chapter 5, back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Why? Because we just read it. This was the decree of the Torah under the first covenant. You can't break one part of it. Verse 4. Notice this very carefully again. Because he got to repeat itself. He didn't explain it in Romans. They didn't explain it in Acts. Now he got to explain it again in, Gen in uh, Galatians. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by 
by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Go back to Romans, the fourth chapter, to understand that argument. We're not justified by works. God don't owe us nothing. We are only justified by faith through Christ Mashiach or HaMashiach. You see what he's explaining about the circumcision? If you are seeking to be justified by circumcision, you got nothing coming. Not one iota. Verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. What is he saying? In other words, look, whether you circumcise or uncircumcise, it don't avail anything if you don't have love or a purified heart. Well, how can he say that? We're going to show you how he can say it. He got it right from the prophets. Let's go back into Romans first, though. Romans, the second chapter. Paul sort of explains it a little bit here. Romans chapter 2, starting at verse 25. For circumcision verily profiteth if you or thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Notice his argument, because he's gathering it from the prophet. Uncircumcision or circumcision don't mean nothing if your heart isn't pure. You could be uncircumcised, you could be circumcised. What matters is a purified heart. Notice what he's explaining. Even if you are circumcised, if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So all you who going to seek to be justified by the law, you got to keep the whole thing because as soon as you break the law, your circumcision is counted as nothing. Saul continues, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, in other words, first he believes, and now he's cleared of guilt. While he's uncircumcised, he's counted as circumcised. Why? Because the Most High circumcised his heart. And once his heart is circumcised, what will he do? He will fulfill the law. Remember, Moses is being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. Judge ye who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law. In other words, if it or if he fulfilled the law, he will judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. In other words, these Gentiles, these people who you railing against, if you don't keep the law, if you don't observe the spirit, they gonna judge you. Now why did Paul say of circumcision? Or circumcision don't avail anything but love. What do you mean by love? The keeping of the commandments and the Torah by the Spirit. And believe me, for clarity, to keep according to, to keep the commandments according to the Spirit, we're literally saying keep them. But not just through going through the motions, but you keep them according to the Spirit. You keep them because you desire to. You don't steal because you don't want to. Your heart won't allow you to steal from your brother. You love your neighbor so you won't harm him. That's the law by the Spirit. You observe the Sabbath day because you love the Almighty. You want to be obedient and you're thankful to him. That's observing the law by the Spirit. You are circumcised because you love him and you want to be obedient unto him, that's 
observing the law in the spirit. Now notice where Paul got this argument from that, man, look, uncircumcision or circumcision really don't avail. It don't mean much of anything whether you uncircumcised or circumcised. You could still go to hell. Jeremiah, the fourth chapter. And we have three texts after this. Jeremiah chapter 4. It reads, The Creator declares, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not be removed. And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nation shall, be, shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. That's if Israel, you be the standard like you're supposed to be, but we have other teachings on that. Notice this. But thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. You see, just because they circumcised wasn't going to stop them from being condemned. Unless they show love, justice, and righteousness. Their uncircumcision or their circumcision didn't mean anything. You see what the Almighty is teaching? Flip right over to Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. Paul said he believed all things written in the law and the prophets, and the manner in which he was teaching people called heresy. But Paul was teaching, Saul was teaching exactly what the prophets was teaching. In order for you to inherit the world, it only going to come through faith and a, and a changed heart. And that is the only way you can really fulfill the law. Now, Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, starting at verse 24. Notice this very carefully. But let him that glorious, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Now, we got teachers on knowing the Almighty. That's an interesting subject as well. But let him that under, that he that understandeth knoweth me. Let him glory that he know the Almighty. That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. And if Israel are to be his representatives, it don't matter if you circumcise or uncircumcise. If you don't have loving kindness and righteousness, it means nothing. This is what Paul was arguing, exactly what Jeremiah is arguing. But verse 24 again, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. You see where Paul was getting this argument from? Circumcision and uncircumcision don't envelop anything but love through faith is what does it. This is where he's getting it from. Loving kindness, 
Righteousness is what the Creator delights in. You see, this is what the prophet is saying. And the Creator follows up. I'm going to punish the circumcised and the uncircumcised. You see what Paul was arguing? Exactly what the prophet is saying. Verse 26. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. You see how their circumcision in the flesh didn't profit them at all, but their circumcision in the flesh by default, was simply counted as uncircumcision because they're going to suffer the same fate as the uncircumcised. Why? Because they didn't believe the Almighty. They didn't have faith in the Almighty. They didn't have a changed heart to execute loving kindness. Therefore, because they didn't believe, they wasn't saved, even though they were, uh, even though they were circumcised. I think the people owe Paul an apology. Because if you don't straighten it out and repent of the lies that you've been saying against this Torah teacher, the day going to come when the divine courts, they're going to require a pound of flesh. So you better get it together. Ezekiel chapter 44, we got one more after this. You better get it together. All of this haughtiness, all of these people running around here think that they're the super Hebrews. Don't let what you have learned deceive you. I think you have taken too much upon yourself. You're criticizing the wrong people, especially if your knowledge don't even come close to the knowledge of these elders. I see novices on YouTube, and I hear in a win, these cats have been studying for a few months to a couple of years, three, four years, and they running out blaspheming. Speaking against teachers who was raised in the culture. Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, raised in the culture. Peter, Thomas, James, raised in the culture. Paul, Saul, raised in the culture. Stephen, raised in the culture. They knew they were Israelites. Paul spoke several different languages. They spoke Hebrew. They were Hebrews of Hebrews. And you got these novices running around the day that got the audacity to blaspheme these elders. You better get it together. Because you're going to be weighed in the balance. And I'm willing to wager that you get this right. You're going to be found wanting. Boy, 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 all your pride, all your pride going to fall upon you like a ton of bricks because they prideful nowadays, arrogant. If you're going to be a student and even a teacher, you better be a better student if you're a teacher. And you better humble yourself and approach these prophets, these elders with respect. That's my advice to you. Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel the 44th chapter. Paul said he believed all things and he did. And he understood. He knew the order of things for salvation under the new covenant. That same order he learned from the law and the prophets. And he knew this. 
here in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 44, starting at verse 6. Ezekiel 44, verse 6. It reads, And thou shalt say to the rebellious house, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith Yehoah Elohim, or the Lord thy God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers uncircumcised in heart. You see what matters first? The heart. That's the first step. To redemption You have brought into my sanctuary Strangers uncircumcised In heart That's why Paul In order for him to follow the protocol Of the temple He knew That he had to have the Gentiles Or the strangers Circumcised in the heart Before he could Even bring them To the threshold of the God Of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. He knew it. After they were circumcised in the heart, then he declared that they will fulfill the law in Romans 2. Then he de- declared that they will follow the steps of Abraham once they believe. Then they will receive the sign of their belief by being obedient to the law. Paul knew that he had to bring them before the Almighty with a circumcised heart first. Just as Ezekiel was explaining. Ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers uncircumcised in the heart and uncircumcised in flesh to be in my sanctuary to pollute it. Even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat, and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. Notice this. And ye have not kept the charge of my holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Verse 9. Thus saith the Lord God, no stranger, uncircumcised in heart, nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. So you got to circumcise the heart. Once the heart is circumcised, circumcision of the flesh is no sweat. Go to our last text, Colossians. Paul wasn't teaching that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. He was teaching that the Gentiles will not be saved by circumcision. And if you're smart, you would teach the same thing. See, everybody who believes that they're going to be saved by the law and not by the spirit of a changed heart, they all messed up. That's why you got all these feuds and hate and everything going on right now. Because the heart's not circumcised. And they struggle to keep the law because the heart's not circumcised. And so what do you have among the community? Strife, envy, variance, hatred, seditions. All this among the communities. While they call themselves keeping the Sabbath day. While they call themselves wearing fringes and being circumcised. Man, you got to start with the heart. And we consider our class students of the new covenant. And therefore, we got to read the Torah according to the New Covenant. Therefore, we can understand the spirit of the Torah. And most high willing, if we believe, he will cause us to believe, and we're going to be justified. And most high willing, we're going to make it into the kingdom. But you got to go about it the right way, people. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, I'll read this and open it up to my host. I appreciate the time he has given us 
to present a discussion today about Saul, the Torah teacher, and circumcision to sort of put in context the apostles' argument on circumcision and Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Let's read. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. See, once they believe, now the apostle is saying, be obedient. Now we know Jesus of Nazareth was a Torah observant Israelite. So once you believe, follow him. When you follow him, you will walk after the Torah. And if you walk like he walked, then his blood, which represents his life, will cleanse you. His life will cleanse you. And it's no strange thing that blood represents life. Just like I hear this foolishness, like people, like the apostle was really talking about literal blood. I hear these cats running around mocking. I tell you this. You listen to this. You go back and read when the mighty men of David seen that David was thirsty. And they were in the heat of the battle, surrounded on all sides. And they went in. And went and got David some water to bring it back for him to drink. David said, I'm not going to drink this water. This water is the blood of the men who risked their lives. I'm not going to drink it, and they don't have nothing to drink. The blood represents the deeds and the life of the individual according to the symbolism of the Torah and the prophets. So to be washed in the blood of the Messiah is to walk after his deeds and walk after his ways. But those are the teachers. Paul is explaining. Ye have therefore received Christ Jesus Walk ye in him, walk like he walked, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men after the rudiments of the world and not after the Messiah. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. And this is why I want to end this, conclude about this belief. Because of the position of this Messiah. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands. That same circumcision that Jeremiah talked about. That same circumcision that Moses talked about. That same circumcision that Ezekiel talked about, the circumcision of the heart. You can't come into a sanctuary unless that's done first. And this is what Paul is explaining. You have received the circumcision made without hands in putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of the Messiah or Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through faith of the operation of God. Now your belief causes this operation of God to take place in you. Who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins. And the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened or brought alive. Or quickened together with him. Having forgiven you, blotting out all your trespasses. 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. I figured I would end on that verse. What is he explaining? Your certificate of debt that was accumulated under the first covenant has been forgiven. The blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances is a certificate of debt. Historically speaking, if you research it historically, in Colossae, the Colossians knew that whenever a debt was paid, they would take the receipt of the debt and nail it to the door of the one who paid the debt. So Saul is speaking figuratively here. He's not talking about the laws being nailed to the cross. He's talking about the debt that was acquired under the first covenant was paid by Christ. And the certificate of debt was nailed to his cross, just like anyone who paid a debt in Colossians, the state would take the debt certificate and nail it to the door of the one who paid the debt. I figured I'd throw that one in there. He's not talking about the law that was nailed to the cross. He's talking about the condemnation and the debt receipt that was accumulated under the first covenant. Now we have been cleared of guilt. The debt have been paid by the Messiah because we believe in him. Our hearts must be circumcised, and this is what saves us. Once we're saved, because of our belief in the Messiah who paid our debt to redeem us from the curse of the first covenant, thereby saving us so we can inherit the eternal promises, now we walk after him. Now we walk at like Abraham walked. Moses is being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. And our circumcised heart that God will give us will cause us to walk in his spirit. I said that was the last one, but you know what? I'm going to throw this one in here. I'm going to throw this one in here, and I hope I got the time to do this one. This is really the last one. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, to confirm what I'm saying. And when we get to the book of Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, I would like to start reading at verse 25. And it reads, I'll start at verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. And from all your idols will I cleanse you. Notice this operation that the Almighty have been doing through the ages. Verse 26. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and what will this do? And cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. This has been the order. This has been the protocol. 
This has been the way and the teachings of Paul or Saul and the New Covenant teachers. So with that, I will turn it over to the host, and maybe we have some people online for some questions. Um, but I will turn it over, and I thank you for the time given to me this evening. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. All right, family, it's about that time. You don't want to go to the phone lines, but about now, the number is 319 Five two seven six two three nine. If you're new, you're listening on the internet. You got to dial that number. You got to press number one, and that lets me know that you have a question or a comment for a special guest, Brother Judah. If you just joined in, today's show is entitled "Torah Teacher, Apostle Paul, and Circumcision." You can always go back and check out the archives. If you're on iTunes in the podcast section. Just type in the search box "Debate Talk" to number four and let you subscribe. It's absolutely free on iTunes. Of course, we're on Blog Talk Radio, and of course. Catch the archives on YouTube. Well, let's go to the first caller. Eight one three two four zero. You're live. Hey, Shalom, Sal. Hey, Sal. It's a little noisy where I'm at. Can you put me back on hold and I go somewhere more quiet? And you take the next uh, caller and then come back to me. All right, we'll do. We have an email question for you. Um, I think it's a two-part email question. Let me read it to you. Hold on. It says. Paul says circumcision is nothing. So how is a commandment nothing? Example, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. That's the question. Oh, yes. Yeah, he's making reference to the book of Corinthians. And I didn't add that in today's teaching. And what that individual must do is look at the entire teaching that he was dealing with in Corinthians. Again, what Saul was arguing is that what we have established already. Circumcision cannot save you. Only keeping the commandments of the Almighty could. And that entails, in that context, the commandment of submitting and Get, uh, believing in the Almighty first, then He will purify the heart. Then we will be justified. What was happening in Corinthians at that time? If our if our reader would take the time out to check it out in First Corinthians, the second chapter, Paul was arguing with the people of Corinth that circumcision didn't mean anything to them at that moment in time for special reasons. Because in Corinth, chapter 2, for example, it would do them well to read the whole letter, but I'll give you a briefing on what we have found. 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, before we get to 7, Saul is building an argument here. And uh, chapter 2, starting at verse 1, he explains that, And I, brother, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Christ or Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Notice, he didn't want to discuss anything with the Corinthians except the Messiah and him crucified. And that teaching entails the circumcision of the heart, the purification of the heart through faith. Now he explains in verse 12. Verse 12 he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, 
but they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And I went down to go right back up to show you what I mean here. That the apostle began to explain that, in fact, I'll read verse 15. But he that is spiritual judges, judges all things. Yet he himself is judge of no man. Now notice what he began to explain in their in his argument with the people of Corinth. He explained to them carefully about understanding the spiritual things of Christ because when he came to them, he didn't want to discuss anything but Christ and him crucified. Now go right over to chapter 3 to continue his argument. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. So in that condition, when he's read when you read now first Corinthians chapter seven, he was telling them all to abide how they were called in. You were called in circumcision? Abide in your calling. If you're called in uncircumcision, don't seek to be circumcised. If you called a slave, called in being a slave, remain a slave. If you called in marriage, don't seek to be unmarried. Why? Because I want to teach you and to focus, teach you to focus on Christ and him crucified because you are yet carnal and everything that Paul named he was teaching them to not put their minds on anything carnal at the moment while he was trying to teach them about Christ and him crucified and the purifying of the flesh or the purifying of the heart through faith. So the question to ask in 1 Corinthians is how long was Paul telling them to remain that way? And notice the slight exaggeration in Corinthians, so we could put this into more of a perspective. He said, look, Corinthians 7, he declared that uh, verse 18, is any man called being circumcised, let him not become un." circumcised. Now that's physically impossible. I know historically that some of the Israelites were trying to go through an operation to be circumcised, but Paul not talking about that here. In fact, there was nothing in the doctrines that even caused a man from Paul's teaching to want to be uncircumcised. So don't just look at if you're called or circumcision means nothing, read the whole thing. He summed it up, and he, he sort of put it in context when he said, but the co- keeping of the commandments of God. Now, when you look at the keeping of the commandments of God, what was more important, circumcision or faith in the creator first? It was faith in the creator first. Then circumcision followed. So before you are even spiritual because you are yet carnal. I'm not talking to you about doing anything else. If you're yet carnal, just remain where you are. Focus on getting your mind and your spirit together. If you a slave, don't worry about nothing else but getting your carnality done away with. If you are circumcised, don't worry about nothing else but getting your mind together. If you are uncircumcised, Don't worry about nothing else but getting your mind together because Paul declared that they were still yet carnal. That's why it's important to take the entirety of the teaching of Saul to realize his argument. He told them that because they were yet carnal. 
and him being a minister of the new covenant, he knew they had to be spiritual and get rid of the carnal heart in order for anything that they was to be doing to be justified before God. So that's a briefing on that text that he had asked. All right. Let's see if uh, 813 is free at this time. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, I'm free. Uh, Shalom, Elder. How you doing? Shalom. Okay, I'm not trying to throw a wrench in your lesson here because I tell people all the time, uh, mainly those of the uh, Sunday Christians, that Paul does not teach against the law. I teach everybody that Paul in Galatians chapter 5 and Romans chapter 7, that he's drawing a contrast between the flesh and the spirit. But through the flesh, he can do no good. But through the spirit, he can accomplish all things. But yet, they only want to focus on where it says you are not under the law. Well, of course you're not under the law when you're under the law of the spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Are you following me right quick? So far, yes. Okay. There, there we agree. Therefore, me and you agree right there. But when you were talking about the new covenant, I have to um, be in disagreement with you because you said that Paul, Peter, and everyone taught the new covenant. I would like to ask you, according to the new covenant that is to be given to Israel, how is it that Israel is in the new covenant, which is that you say is of life when they are still under the curses, which bring death? Are you saying that Israel now has to wait until death and the resurrection to receive life? Or was this entire um, covenant to um, bring life during our time on this earth? Because um, it just seems a little confusing what you were putting forth right there. Yeah, well, the, the thing is this, is that the life that is promised is the resurrection of the dead. That's where the, that's where the apostle is drawing from the book of Isaiah, the 25th chapter. He's also drawing it from the book of Job, the 14th chapter. So when you're looking at the life of the new covenant, they're telling you, they're promising you that yet the body shall rise again in the first resurrection. So this is what they're promising, that if you take hold on the new covenant, which is a progression, it's a progression. It don't just happen in 24 hours. If you become a part of the new covenant, which is based upon the Torah being written upon the heart, then you shall receive the gift and the promise of being heirs of the world. This is what the prophet okay. said. Okay, now, was the first covenant put on our heart? No, the first covenant was based upon tables of stone. It wasn't required that it be upon your heart as far as whether you were stoned or not. Because you could have evil and malice in your heart, Moses wouldn't know that at all. So it was based upon the outward showing. Even though the Most High gave us signs in the Torah of what he required, yet and still, that first covenant that he made with them, he declared it was upon the tables of stone, or in so many words, it was by the letter. So as long as you kept the Sabbath day and you didn't outwardly break it, you were straight. They couldn't look into your heart and see whether you wanted to keep it or not. Okay, can you read Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, and I'm going to fall back. All right. Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14, for this commandment, which I command thee this day, is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say who shall go up for us to heaven to bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Yes, 
That's no conflict. But the covenant wasn't made there. He's letting you know that you don't have to go far off to receive these words. He wanted in your heart, but the covenant wasn't there at that moment in time. It was simply written upon tables of stone, just like it reads in the book of Exodus. Now he's teaching you that word that I've been teaching you. It, you don't have to go far off to do it. It's, it's, it should be right there in your conscience. That's true. Nobody arguing with that. But that still do not establish here that he made the covenant with them there. Show me the text where he said he made the covenant with them under the first covenant upon their hearts. Just like he specified in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, let's go there. He will set it straight for us in case of any confusion. Let the Almighty speak for himself. Hey, Sal, let me um, come back in. Let, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna answer, ask him a question. Yeah, I thought you just said you was gonna fall back, but hold on, let me. Oh, get this okay. Here. I thought I was on mute. I'm sorry. I thought I was still on mute. No, what okay. I'm saying is, listen, to what I'm saying right quick, because I think you no, think no, that no, I'm no, trying no, to be I'll in conflict with you. I give you, time. Give you time. I give you, I give you a time, just a moment though. Bear with me a minute. Let me go ahead and read this Jeremiah 31, because we read Deuteronomy for you, and it didn't say that's where the covenant was being established. It just simply said that the word is by the within your hearts, but the covenant wasn't established there. And the reason why I say that is this, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inwards and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So now this is the covenant basis, not on stones where Moses sprinkled the blood. That's where they established the first agreement this agreement is, unless the law is in your heart, I have nothing to do with you. So that's what I mean by the new covenant being established in the heart, the differentiation between the two. Okay. Okay. Well, what well, well, I'm just sitting up here saying this, Elder uh, Yeshua, is you stated that you just stated that there was no covenant made, but you just read Jeremiah 31. And he just said they broke that covenant that he took whoa, whoa, them by whoa, the whoa, hand whoa, whoa. and made with them coming out of Egypt. I said, I, I said there was no covenant made? When yes, did I say that? you just said that. No. You no, just I said, said it like there, two minutes ago. No, I said the covenant wasn't made upon the heart. The first covenant was made but upon it says the, that the in, agreement was made but it's, with the tables of stone. You got to listen carefully now. Okay. Okay, I see what you're saying, but it clearly tells you that he put that covenant in their heart to do it because we have the prophet Jeremiah and we have the prophet Ezekiel and the book of Lamentations also says that their hearts were hardened, that they would not listen to the covenant that their maker had made with them. But well, I don't want to I don't want to shake up your entire lesson because it does prove no, I'm not, the Sunday I'm not Christian about wrong. That at all. I, I don't I don't mind a little bit of shake rattle and roll. I'm not the rest I'm oh. not like the rest. <laughs> No, Chris oh, Harris isn't man. trying to do that anymore. Period, though. You know what I'm saying? I'm, 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 I'm out of that. I'm done with that. <laughs> That's yeah, all. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but I understand as yeah. far. I understand where you're coming from. But yeah, no. Yeah. Dealing with that, I don't believe. I believe your name is Chris. Your voice sounds familiar. Yes, sir. That's right. Yeah, I don't yes. perceive that from. I've heard you on Sal's show. I don't perceive it. I believe that you honestly searching for things. So I don't gather that from you. But um yeah okay. so but yeah we do see like you said um you see where I'm coming from with that and uh, again yeah. I will have to see the text where the almighty made that covenant upon the heart the covenant now and not just on stone that's the key the covenant being made there Okay okay um well maybe me and you will talk one day um and I bid you shalom and may the most I keep you and bless you. Thanks, Al. Keep Thank up the good you. work. I appreciate that. Thanks for the call.
Brian Hill, this is Vice President number one. Uh, this is your time. If you want to make a comment, you want to have a quick question, you know that number, 319-527-6239. Uh, simply press number one or forever hold your peace. <laughs> uh, but um, let's go to the email then. Hold on. Let's go to the email real quick. All right, there's a follow-up question. All right, it says, do these two scriptures below show circumcision is nothing? Isaiah 52, verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on your... Oh, my Hello? The whole... Yes, can you hear me? Are you there? Yes, I hear you. I hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me read it again for you. Let me read the email. It says, do these two scriptures below show circumcision is nothing? Isaiah 52, verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. And the second scripture is Ezekiel 44, verse 9. Thus saith the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised into my sanctuary. Broke up? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, what it says, Ezekiel 44, verse 9. Maybe you want to read it? You read it? I'm breaking up. No, Ezekiel actually, we read it already. I, I, we read it tonight. Okay. Maybe he there wasn't paying there attention. We right. <laughs> we read it. Yeah. And it seems like he hasn't been paying attention or he has selective hearing if this is the same individual. And no, circumcision is something in its proper context. And this is what we've been establishing all night. Now, let me show you something. Let's go back to the book of Jeremiah if the listener is still listening. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. And he tell me if circumcision is something. Jeremiah chapter 9, and that's the problem. They need to slow down and listen. Do more listening than you do talking, then maybe you can get it together. And you should listen and not always, you know, sometimes when people talk, they automatically trying to think of rebuttal instead of just listening. And therefore, that's probably what we have going on with us tonight. Now, if we go to Jeremiah, that's ninth chapter. It says, verse 25, Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Egypt and Judah, Edom and the children of Ammon. Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. So, my friend, if you go back and read that Ezekiel, don't go right over the order of things. You notice how in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, or excuse me, the 44th chapter, verse 9, it teaches us. Very, very carefully that this. Thus saith Yehoah Elohim, no stranger uncircumcised in heart. Don't read past that one, because that's the key. This has been our argument the whole night. So if you're not uncircumcised in a heart, your reference to Isaiah means nothing. Just like Jeremiah explained, the Israelites were circumcised, but they will suffer the repercussions and the vengeance of the Almighty, yet and still, because they were uncircumcised in heart. So yes, this is what we've been saying. If you are not circumcised in heart through faith and belief, then your circumcision in the flesh is nothing. And if you read Ezekiel carefully, my friend, you will find that Ezekiel saying the same thing. You could not come into the sanctuary just circumcised in the flesh, could you? You had to be circumcised in the heart. Now you tell me, which one come first? And when you answer that, then you on the, you on the road to what we're talking about tonight. I turn it over to the host. All right, fam, we only got a few minutes left, uh, we have like 13 minutes left to be exact. Uh, we have uh, listeners checking out the show, but nobody else is pressing number one at this time. So if nobody else is going to press number one, we're going to get some final words from Brother Judah. Once Hello? To get a new season. Yes. Can you hear me now? 
You said final words? Yes, final words. All right. First, I'd like to say, man, uh, peace and blessing to you and your house, you and your wife oh, hold and your on, family. Hold on. Uh, sorry. Hold on one second. Hold on. Somebody actually pressed number one right after, as soon as you went oh. in. <laughs> Somebody pressed number one as soon as you went in. Let's take this quick comment. Let's see what this is. Uh, 770 you're live. Hey, Shalom, Sal. Shalom, Elder Judah. This is Brother Josh. How you doing, Elder? Oh, my goodness. Oh, I, my, I got a visitor here tonight. How you doing, Josh? How you doing? I'm doing pretty good, brother. Pretty good. You know, I had to call in, you know, and um, encourage and, you know, give my, um, you know, my mentor props for what he's doing tonight. I think tonight was a beautiful lesson. I think it was easily explained and easily followed. I really don't see. I understand that the topic in itself is a difficult one. I understand that, but from what I heard tonight, you you broke it down very simple. You show, because I teach it almost identical, that you got to get circumcised in the heart first. That's what matters first, and that is That's a right. Torah to knock concept. You follow what I'm saying? Paul did not make that up on the fly, neither did Peter That's or right. anybody else. They were already teaching that. They were already saying you got to get your mind right because, you know, faith coming by, um, you know, by hearing the word of God, you know how it goes, something like that. Amen. You know what I'm saying? That's right. You got to fear him first. You got to believe in him first before you obey him first. That's common sense. If you don't believe in something, you're not going to fear it or adhere to it. That's common sense. That's, That's right. what he wants the children of Israel to do first. Listen to me okay. first. After that, believe in me first, then come to obedience. That's all Paul right. was saying. And in the first century, you had these Jews teaching people that you had to be circumcised to get salvation. That has never been true, ever. That's right. You follow what I'm saying? You That's know, right. In fact, in, in the Tanakh, circumcision was more of a initiation for the, um, you know, the other nations into the covenant. It was just an act of faith showing that they're really being grafted in to Israel. I know you didn't really go in that direction with it, but you know that's how the strangers I understand. got a part of Israel, you know. So a lot of people don't even know what the circumcision was really all about anyway, and then they get to the New Testament, and Christians want to say, oh, you got to get circumcised anymore because it's not for salvation. They missed the entire point. I love that breakdown that you gave um, in Acts and how, you know, the four laws, and some people try to say that's the only thing that the Gentiles had to do. That's nonsense right there. I don't heard somebody say that. It's like out of those four things, there's so many other things that any Christian would tell you you still supposed to be doing now. So you can't say that's the only four things Gentiles had to do because I don't recall them saying anything about loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and loving your neighbor as yourself. They don't appear in those four um Pre self right. they gave to the Gentiles, but Good you'll point. still say we got to do that. You'll still say we got to do that too, though. So don't try to take those four precepts and make them the only, um, you know, requirement for you to get salvation. And then turn around and say, well, there is more. Well, why can't we say that as these Israelites that there was more? That's right. You follow what I'm That's saying? Right. So yep. it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful lesson. Um, the circumcision has a spiritual circumcision. You got to get your heart circumcised. That's why when y'all went to that um, Jeremiah and he said, you know, the house of Israel is uncircumcised in the heart, and he was talking about how he's going to destroy Israel and the stranger. When he said the uncircumcised there, he meant the literal uncircumcised, and then he put them on par with the literal uncircumcised because they were uncircumcised in the heart. So you're going to get the sword just like the uncircumcised believers. You follow what I'm saying? That's what he was giving right. them about a lot of people don't understand this stuff. To not only don't understand, like you were saying, about the two extremes, you know what I'm saying? You got the one extreme. We ain't got to get circumcised at all. We ain't got to keep no law in other extremes. But to not only, oh, Paul teaching against Torah law, and don't even understand that Paul is giving you, and I love the way you said this too, um, the, oper- the order of operation. You follow what I'm saying? When you did that yes, Abraham sir. explanation about how Abraham, Abraham had to believe first, after belief comes obedience. Anybody would tell you that. When any Hebrew Israelite today, most of them Judah, and we can all agree, most of us started out either in a Sunday church or just not really going to church at all. But it That's wasn't right. until we started believing yes. the doctrine that we started obeying it. 
That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And people don't That's get that right. stuff. This is real simple. That's what I'm saying. You took a complicated topic, because it is complicated. I tell anybody that. Whenever you deal with anything, Paul said, it can get real complicated. But you took uh-huh. a very complex topic, and just like a complex fraction, you simplified that bad boy. You follow what I'm saying? So I just want to tell you, beautiful class, anybody who's tuned in late and found upload this, please do yourself a favor and listen to it again from the beginning because I think a lot of times, too, and I agree with you, too, Judah, you said some people got selective hearing. You follow what I'm saying? Or when they're listening to your explanation, instead of listening to the explanation, they're already repairing, I mean, preparing a rebuttal in their minds. That's how some people listen. They're listening That's right. to repeat. You follow what I'm saying? Rather than yep. to make an astute observation of what being said to them. You know what I'm saying? And also, some people see the title of the class, class almost over with. They want to tune in when the class got like <laughs> five minutes of teaching left and then start making objections when a lot of these objections were already addressed. addressed. So it's not just That's collective right. hearing or, repa- or preparing a rebuttal in your head. It's also you want to tune in at the end of the movie and then try to explain and critique the whole movie. You can't do that. That's right. You follow what I'm saying? You can't do that. So, you can't. again, beautiful class. I praise God for what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? And now, if you don't have anybody else, and I, by the way, let me apologize for interrupting when you was about to do your final statements. If there's nobody no, else. No, you're good. You know, you're good. Take Thanks it away, brother. Peace. No doubt. And peace to you. Peace and blessings to you down there in the south, you and your family, Josh. So uh, appreciate that. Appreciate the edification. Uh, good. I'm glad you put put that out there as another witness on what we're dealing with tonight. No doubt, no doubt. All right, Brother Judy, you can close out. Nobody else is standing by. You can close out. All right, again, peace and blessings to you all. And, again, you and your family, uh, Brother Sal, I thank you all for tuning in and those who watch uh, or those who listen in. We uh, definitely appreciate that. And I would like to add, if anyone who's interested, in some of our uh, articles and literature, you can uh, find us on the uh, VNMP.org, Facebook.com slash NMP News. So one is the VNMP.org, the other one is Facebook.com slash NMP News. You can find us on YouTube. Knesset Yeshua, K-N-E-S-S-E-T, Y-S-H-U-A. We have other sites, Zadok Ben Israel and Sister Benaniah. So if you go on the Knesset Yeshua page, if you just go to related pages, you will find other pages that we also have up. And those who maybe listen locally, because I found some people actually listen to your show, uh, Sal, and they actually down here in the city. So those who may be listening locally, uh, we have a television show called The Law and the Testimony. <clears throat> it airs on Tuesdays at 8 p.m., and it repeats on Saturdays at 7.30 p.m. And we also have a show called What is to be Done. It airs on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., and it airs again on Fridays at 10.30 p.m. Uh, we will be starting up our Liberation Theology Study Groups again, most high willing, first week in September. And uh, we have that open on Facebook every now and again. And those who may be local, if you want to stop in, it will be at the Franklin E. Merriweather Library from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. And we'll be starting back up in September. And, uh, again, we appre- I appreciate the time. If you want interested in some of our Sabbath classes, uh, we have our Sabbath class that begins at 1.30 p.m. Um, at the end, open it up with songs and testimonies. Our law reading begins at 2.30. And we also have biblical teachings, foundational teachings at 7.30 p.m. And that is actually hosted by our brother, Elder Timothy, Tim, Tim, Elder Timothy Clyburn. So um, I appreciate the time. And uh, maybe uh, most I see fit. Got room again? Maybe I could come on and do something else again. I appreciate it though, much appreciated. And I thank you for your time, sir. All right, most definitely. You know, we're gonna definitely bring it back uh, for the new season starting in September. 
But uh, tune in tomorrow, guys. This is going to be the last uh, show for the summer special, the last one. Make sure you tune in, and uh, uh, special guest will be Brother Josh. So tune in tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. See you guys next time.